Hello, uh, my name is Amar Krishnaswamy. I'm an interventional cardiologist at the uh, Cleveland Clinic uh, Transcatheter Aortic Valve Replacement Team. I'm joined today by Dr. Lars Svensson, who's the uh, chairman of the Seidel and Arnold Miller Family Heart and Vascular Institute and a cardiac surgeon, and uh, Dr. Samir Kapadia, who's an interventional cardiologist and the section head of our interventional cardiology division. We're also joined by Dr. William Stewart, who's an imaging expert and been taking care of aortic valve disease patients for over 30 years now. What we'd like to do is discuss the findings and the implications of the PARTNER 2A trial uh, demonstrated recently at the American College of Cardiology scientific sessions. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So, Dr. Kapadia, let me ask you, what would you say are the main take-home messages from the PARTNER 2A trial? I think the most important thing is that this was a randomized, well-controlled trial meaning that the surgery, patients were randomized to either surgery or to transcatheter valves. And the most important take-home message was that surgery and transcatheter valves were equal in terms of mortality, stroke, and other outcomes, which was a novel finding in the sense that in the past trials, we did not find complete equivalence. We had some areas where surgery was better, some areas where transcatheter valves were better. Here, it turns out that in almost all the things that we looked for, uh, both were very similar. So this is a, a step forward in the transcatheter valve therapy treatments. And Dr. Svensson, uh, in this trial, they specifically uh, studied patients who were considered at an intermediate risk for surgery. How do you define what is an intermediate risk patient as a surgeon? Well, I, I think... Um, I, we need to go back to the basics here, and there are several issues to deal with when discussing the partner trials, and the one is that we're dealing with the outcomes of various centers, and the key thing is what is the outcome at an individual center in comparison to the partner trial data? So, for example, here at the Cleveland Clinic, our mortality rate for the last five years has been 0.46% for open AVRs, 2,230 isolated AVRs. And then you compare that what's happened in the partner trial. Then you've got to deal with the issue of the costs of these devices. Does society uh, have the wherewithal to pay for it? The other issue is the regulatory one, which is will the government allow us to move into the intermediate risk uh, patients and uh, take care of those patients in the way that we feel best uh, going forwards. And there's the regulatory side, the FDA approval, et cetera, uh, side of all of this. Now, in Partner 2A, uh, uh, and this is the trial we're talking about, we found that the outcomes were equivalent when comparing open AVR and patients who had TAVO. Now, there are some subtleties because there were two papers that were presented. The one was the randomized trial, intermediate risk. But when we started that trial, there were patients who were high risk included in that because the entry criteria was above four, and there was no upper limit. Later on, when we got the commercial devices available for the very high risk patients, then those patients went into a high risk, and we didn't have to put the patients in the trial. And then if you look at the trial comparing the registry patients, which were the S3 patients, versus the earlier run partner A1 patients, there there was a restriction of STS between four and six. The very high risk patients were in the commercial arm, and so those uh, were not in the Included. So there are some subtle differences between these trials. I think one important point about partner two is that if you take the, the programs involved in this across the country, then there was equivalence in outcomes, surgery versus the patients who had TAVO, but also in the transfemoral patients, so the patients who could be done through a transfemoral route they performed better with a transfemoral approach to open AVR. Now, the p-value was 0.05. The trial wasn't specifically powered to look at that, but that was something we found. Now, we, we had that as a test we were going to look at. And then in the, in the 
S3 versus the older patient trial, the comparison showed superiority with S3. And I think there are many reasons that we can discuss about the reasons for that. But in general, you would say that this is mainly for the intermediate risk. We are not talking about low risk. We are yeah. going to test it. But intermediate risk is the people who are deemed to have risk of what, 4 to 8 percent for uh, having an open procedure. So they are not really that many patients. Yes. This is, a relatively speaking, a smaller number of patients with aortic stenosis compared to the low risk population. Yes, yeah, so if, if you look at the bell curve of patients in the um, STS, then if you take the 4 to 8 uh, percent mortality risk patients, that takes about a third of the the patients in the entire group of patients in STS uh, registry. So, you know, as you point out, the next step will be to look at the lower risk uh, patients. This was intermediate risk uh, and then lower risk. So the partner three trial will be in patients who uh, will be randomized above the age of 65 as an entry point. And the, the criteria have changed slightly to the previous partner two tr uh, trial and the partner one trial in that the degree of aortic valve stenosis now will be 1.0 square centimeters instead of 0.8. And then uh, the uh, STS score has to be below 4. So this is going to be a very interesting very trial. Very important trial. So, yeah. so Dr. Kapani, what does this mean for the patient who's out there has not had treatment yet for their aortic stenosis? They're in the intermediate risk group, and their doctor has been talking them to them about surgical aortic valve replacement. Uh, where do they stand now, and so how does that I think the most important message that we want to give out to patients is that the risk assessment is very difficult. So trying to find a center which deals with, which is excellent in surgery and excellent in transcatheter valve treatment should be approached. Let them, a heart team with surgeons and cardiologists to decide that what is the, what is the actual risk of the patient and what is this best treatment because there are so many nuances to what is the best way of treating because small annulus, large annulus, femoral access, no femoral access, what are the comorbidities, LV function, coronary disease. So if anything, to, to leave that question open on whether it's going to be transcatheter or surgical, exactly. in that they're now relatively equal in terms of their risk, let the team in the center make that decision exactly. based on the full information once and we've done the CT scans. And their capabilities, because yeah. I think that's a very important message that Dr. Swenson pointed out, that different centers have different outcomes if you compare the outcomes. So it is important to select the centers where both options have outstanding outcomes. So the one question I'd ask for Bill with your long experience is, should we now be thinking about doing a uh, randomized trial, TAVA, in asymptomatic patients and potentially also surgical arm in asymptomatic patients, randomized versus medical treatment, particularly since the results are so good with uh, the patients who have isolated AVRs and now with TAVO. Particularly, let's take our baseline of 0.5% mortality rate, TAVO, 1% mortality rate. And as you know, there is the risk of sudden death over time whatever the Mayo Clinic paper, I think, said about 2 to 3% per year. So is there now the opportunity? Is Should we now be thinking about a randomized trial, particularly since the current valve guidelines aren't clear on when we should treat asymptomatic patients, and we clearly have data to show that those patients who have severe stenosis but are not treated have a worse prognosis than the patients, in many cases, who are treated with AVR. I think you're right. I think that we're moving toward moving, uh, doing valve procedures, be it transcatheter or surgical, in lower symptomatic or asymptomatic patients. And that's coming out in the literature in terms of mitral regurgitation and in terms of aortic stenosis. There was another uh, presentation at these past meetings about that group. Now, it was a retrospective study. It wasn't well controlled but it did show uh, a better option for patients having preemptive surgery early uh, as opposed to people waiting until they got symptomatic. So I, whether that remains in uh, more proactive uh, uh, prospective studies uh, is unclear. But so then the, the question is, how important is the argument that mitral valve is different? Because in mitral valves, we repair the valve 
versus in the aortic position, we put in a new valve, and sure, the initial results for the first 15 years or so are very good, but then you've got a valve that deteriorates over time, and you could argue to some extent with mitral valve repairs, but they certainly hold up very well long term. How important do you think that argument is in the asymptomatic patients? Because with mitral valves, we're already doing asymptomatic patients. I think you're right that uh, we, we the mitral valve is a very different situation than the aortic stenosis. And when you come out with a prosthesis that has its own decay curve, if you will, over 15, 20 years or, or whatever, that's a very different situation than a surgical valve repair in a in a patient with myxomatous disease with mitral regurgitation, where the prognosis and the ec and the uh, operation free survival is excellent, you know, one percent per one, year reoperation. One question risk. maybe for Amar to say that: Can you just describe how we deal when the patient is referred to us in Cleveland Clinic? How we deal with them currently, and how we work them up, and is it going to change anything in the near future? Because I think this is the most important question that people would be interested in: That how do you? how our heart team works together. And we're still talking yeah. about aortic stenosis. Aortic stenosis, yeah. I think the important thing is that we've enjoyed extraordinarily successful results in our transcatheter aortic valve program over almost a decade now. And the reason we've enjoyed that kind of success is because of the heart team approach. All of our patients are seen by an interventional cardiologist, a cardiac surgeon, an imaging specialist, and a group of nurses. And what this has allowed is for us to decide for a specific patient what is the best treatment. Is it a catheter-based valve procedure? Is it a surgical valve procedure? Is it a continued medical therapy? And I think that to lose sight of what has brought us success and just start doing, whether it's surgery or catheter valve, without a team approach, I think would be unwise. So I think we should continue our structure because that's what's allowed us to take care and of patients so well. And knowing all the data and with all expert people, that will help us to decide what is the best treatment approach. I think the question I would pose uh, for you, Dr. Kapadia, uh, and also to you, Dr. Svensson, is that our results of catheter AVR over the last decade have continuously improved, both at Cleveland Clinic and in the literature. And I think what was very exciting to see about the Partner 2A trial and the Sapien 3 registry was truly how substantially the risks of this catheter valve procedure had reduced from the initial literature reports. So how would you uh, describe uh, these improvements with regard to how the catheter valve technology has changed? For the catheter valve, it is very clear that the valve size, the introduction size in the groin has gotten smaller. We are able to do almost 90% of the patients from transfemoral access, which is another major change, 86% in the part. Less bleeding, too. Less bleeding. Uh, stroke rate is also a little bit less. So I think comparing all the major markers of outcome, we are doing better. And this may be related to the fact that we are moving to a lower risk population. So even the people are at a lower risk. So both the technology is better, we are selecting the patients better, and of course, learning curve is not a trivial matter. And surgically, this is also, as Dr. Svensson mentioned, that things are improving in the surgical world also. So, yeah. so Dr. Svensson, in, in this uh, situation, we've seen a lot of things about paravalvular leak and yes. how that's been a problem, at least for the first generation devices for transcatheter aortic valve replacement. What's happening to change that? Well, I think the, the big improvement, if you look at the S3 registry, is that the incidence of moderate to severe perivalvular leak has come down considerably, and that's because we've got a new skirt. And that has made a huge difference. The other part so of it... their skirt is right under the valve and it prevents that per valve. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's like little cups. Mm -hmm. And so they capture the blood flow and form clot, and they can fit into the areas where there are cracks in the calcium and so on. And so that's reduced uh, the per valve leak rate. But I think what we need to keep an eye out is with... The, the change in way we do the valves now, we're much more gentle because we're worried about rupturing the root and uh, we uh, situate the valve much more carefully. If one compares when we started with the first Sapien valve, we used to really hammer that balloon and inflate it hard and we certainly had some ruptures. But we also got very big orifice areas. In XT, there's a trend to the gradients being slightly 
higher, the RF is slightly smaller, and S3, there's a further trend. And, and that's the question that's So these are the most, more recent valves that are out now. Yeah, so the most recent valves, we may not get as big an orifice because we're not hammering the balloon as much and expanding the valve as much, and we're relying on the skirt to reduce perivalve leak, but we may have slightly greater gradients. The other thing about the S3 is that if you look over time, our peri uh, pacemaker rate has gone up, even though the patients are a lower risk group of patients. And then Samir has obviously led the major uh, research study now on the role of filters in these uh, procedures, and that's going to be very interesting. We've already got data to show that the risk of uh, neurological events is reduced and neurocognitive benefits are there. And so now we're adding more subtle things to make it a safer procedure, but that's adding to the overall cost of the procedure. And potentially, this could end up being, uh, if you take all transcatheter devices, mitral tricuspid aortic valve, something that will cost in the region of four to six billion dollars a year. Now, the majority of these patients are obviously the CMS patients, so this is Medicare that pays for that. And last year, Medicare for the hospital bill, so this is uh, the CMS um, part A, they paid $205 billion. So here's something that's potentially going to add to 2 to 4% of the expense of what CMS has to pay. And that's going to be the challenge that um, the people who pay for this are going to have to yeah. address. I know. I think nothing very good comes cheap. So then yeah. maybe the <laughs> so Dr. Padio, what, what's, how do you compare these uh, these uh, balloon expandable valves to the self-expanding valves? I, I, rem I remember seeing some things about the self-expanding valves having some advantage over surgical outcomes. I think both of these valves, it is very clear that both of these valves have very similar uh, outcomes. There are some differences. You know, the self-expanding valves, uh, do have less chance of annular rupture uh, because they are self-expanding. But on the other hand, the paravalvular leak has been a little bit more, the pacemaker rate has been a little bit more, uh, whereas uh, this and the coronary access is a little bit more difficult. Their gradients are a little bit better because they are supraannular. On the other hand, if you look at the self-expand and the balloon expandable valves, uh, they are more reproducible. Uh, their hemodynamics is uh, not bad. The paravalvular leak is now less. Uh, permanent pacemaker rate is less. So uh, I think, again, the both options available for a patient is critical, and we are using both valves. Uh, we use probably 70% balloon expandable, 30% self-expanding valves, and that is our general trend. And we have another four investigational valves available. So this is a very important new era where we have different valves available. I think the, the final question I would uh, ask uh, to both of you is that now that there is an uh, a trial or a couple of trial data that say that the uh, transcatheter valve is similar or in some way superior in intermediate risk patients to surgery, do you think that this will lead to the FDA expanding their indication for the catheter valve therapy to the intermediate risk patients, or do you think we're looking at still uh, only in high-risk and inoperable patients? I think uh, we'll probably hear uh, in, by the end of the year uh, a ruling from FDA, and I suspect that based on the data that's come out now, they will approve it for intermediate risk. And what I understand, uh, some of the questions were asked about the stroke rate. Well, the stroke rate is essentially the same if you use Rankin-2 as the criteria for cutoff for stroke. Obviously, if you're doing MRI scans and so on, it's a different rate. And if you compare it to our older studies where we were using a different method of looking for strokes, there's been a change in that. And Samia has done a lot of research on that too. So I think we will see a approval for the intermediate risk. And then it becomes a matter, as I said earlier, for individual institutions to use their heart teams to direct the patients to what we recommend as the best treatment for those patients. And, and uh, then, once again, it's going to depend also on the outcomes of the individual institutions. And I think the critical thing is, and one of the things I was asked to talk about at ACC, will or is the heart team affordable? And from my point of view, and I think most of us who were there said, yes, it is very much affordable if you can 
consider the, the, the average cost that a physician is uh, or payment a physician gets from CMS for being part of the heart team procedure, it's very little in comparison to the total cost of the procedure when you take uh, what the hospital gets paid and what the reimbursement is for the entire procedure and obviously the cost of the valves, which is about $32,000 per valve. So we will continue to have a hard team. And as you know, most of our procedures, we have four physicians at the table. So exactly. two, two, yeah. two interventional cardiologists, two cardiac surgeons, apart from anesthesia and imaging. And we have to do that. And I, I have no doubt in my mind that we have saved patients and have had great quality because our team at the table has been so yeah. good and we've helped each other uh, save patients. So. I think that's going to be critical uh, going forward, and we will continue to do that as the best practice for patient care. Very good. Thank um, you. Well, it was an absolute pleasure speaking with all three of you, and thanks for sharing your expertise and uh, with our viewers. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.